Well, good morning, and welcome to Central Baptist Church. My name is uh, my name is Brad, and it's my privilege to serve here as pastor. And I just want to welcome you to to worship today. Uh, it's a, it's a beautiful sunny day, kind of humid, but man, uh, given the rain we've had this week, it's kind of a nice change of pace. And I'm glad to be at church and ready to worship. And I, and I hope that's true for you, whether you are a, a church member here or whether you're a guest. We're glad you're here. Uh, we're here today at God's invitation. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11 that all who are weary and heavy laden should come to him and find rest. And that's what we want to do this morning. I don't know what burdens you feel like you're carrying. Uh, there's a lot going on in the world. And so maybe you came in today with a, a spirit of heaviness, or maybe there are concerns that you've got, anxieties and worries. Jesus says that we can come to him and find rest for our souls and so as we begin worship this morning, I wanted to begin with a time of just silent reflection, just a couple of seconds for us to pause our hearts, to think about those things that we brought with us today, and prepare ourselves to hand them over to Jesus. Will you pray with me? Father in heaven, you know our heaviness and need. You know the pace of our week, how we've run from place to place, and how things that were totally unexpected came in and clouded our thinking. Lord, you know what's on our heart this morning, uh, friends and family members who are sick, suffering. Lord, you know the grief we bear. And so as we enter into your gates with thanksgiving and your courts with praise, we gladly hand those things over to you. You've told us that we don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with us in our weakness, but one who's been tempted in every way as we are, yet he's without sin. You told us that we should draw near to your throne with confidence, find mercy and grace in our time of need. And so, Jesus, we come to you, having heard your invitation to find rest for our souls, and ask humbly that you'd give it to us. Take from us our burdens this morning. Give us a spirit of joy. Help us to rejoice in what you've accomplished for us on the cross and help us to live in the joy of our salvation this week. We pray that as we hear your word preached and read, that your spirit would open our eyes to see you there. That we'd love you more and that you'd change us to be like you. We pray that as we sing these songs, you would hear them from us out of a genuine place, Lord, not just going through the motions not giving you our seconds, but giving you the best of our hearts. You're worth it, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Will y'all stand with us and let's rejoice and sing? Yes, ma'am. Praise God. That is cool. Amen. Well, wow. yeah, that's awesome, Miss Weeks. Thank you for sharing that. All right, let's praise God. Down at the cross where my Savior died Down where for cleansing from sin I cried There to my heart was the blood applied Glory to His name Glory to His name Glory to His name, to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to His name. I am so wondrously saved from sin. Jesus so sweetly abides within. There at the cross where He took me in. Glory to His name. Glory to his name, glory to his name, there to my heart was the blood applied, glory to his name, oh precious fountain that saves from sin, I am so glad I have entered in. There Jesus saves me and keeps me clean. Glory. 
glory to his name glory to his name glory to his name there to my heart was the blood of life glory to his name come to this fountain so rich and sweet Cast thy poor soul at the Savior's feet. Plunge in today and be made complete. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood of life. Glory to His name. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus For my pardon this I see Nothing but the blood of Jesus For my cleansing this my plea Nothing but the blood of Jesus Oh Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not of good that I have done. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh. the blood of Jesus, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Maybe seated. If you would turn in your Bibles now to Psalm 127. While you're doing that, I'm going to catch my breath. <laughs> Psalm 127. Unless the Lord builds a house, the builders labor in vain. 
Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat. For he grants sleep to those he loves. Children are a heritage from the Lord, offspring a reward from him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they contend with their opponents in court. Based on what we just read, I felt it appropriate this morning uh, to have all the children and their parents come forward. And I'd like to just pray over y'all, if, if y'all would, if you want to. Just kind of come forward and stand up here in front of the first pew. Cindy and I were fortunate that we raised our children in this church. Uh, those, those of you that have been here for a while watched my kids, Lauren and Cody, grow up. And I'm so thankful for y'all because I saw firsthand how this church helped me to raise them and helped love them and prayed for them many times. So I want to pray for all of you this morning. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for these precious children that you've graciously entrusted to us to love and to cherish, to teach and to train. Give these parents, Lord, your wisdom as they raise these children up. And I pray that they will grow up into great servants of you, God. That one day you will use them in a special way to bring glory to your name. Lord, hold them close to you and keep them from all harm and danger. Keep them from the many temptations of this life and protect them from the influences of the world system which can so easily shipwreck the pure faith of a young and trusting child. Some of these children, Lord, have already come to trust in Jesus as their Lord and Savior, and we praise you for that. We pray that all these children standing before you today come to know Jesus and grow up in grace and knowledge of the Lord and follow hard after him for all of their days. For we know that knowing you is eternal life, Lord. And Lord, I pray that each and every child and parent grow in godly wisdom and find favor in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. We got one more song we're going to sing. Stand with me. I hear the Savior sing Thy stream indeed is small Child of weakness watch and pray Find in me my own Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. He washed it white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find Thy power and Thine alone And change the leper's spot And melt the heart of stone Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. He 
washed it white as snow. For nothing good have I where thy grace to claim. I'll wash my garments white in the blood. sweet mike asked me if he could do that and that's that's awesome and as a parent man it feels great to know that people are praying for you so i want to appreciate you all for doing that hey at this time we'll we'll dismiss our kids to go to jesus kids where they're going to have fun learning some bible stories and some songs and having their own time of prayer and um parents if you want to go with them you can or turn them loose if they're checked in and while they're going, why don't you grab your copy of God's Word and open it up to Mark chapter 1. And we're going to be in Mark chapter 1, verse 40 today. 40 to 45. And once you get there, why don't you go ahead and stand up with me, and we'll uh, read it together. Mark 1, verse 40, and we're going to be at 45 today. This is what God's Word says. And a leper came to Jesus, beseeching him, and falling on his knees before him, and saying, If you are willing, you can make me clean. And moved with compassion, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, and said to him, I am willing. Be cleansed. And immediately the leprosy left him, and he was cleansed. And he sternly warned him, and immediately sent him away. And he said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded as a testimony to them. But he went out and began to proclaim it freely, and to spread the news around, to such an extent that Jesus could no longer publicly enter a city but stayed out in unpopulated areas. And they were coming to him from everywhere. Will you pray with me once again? God in heaven, we thank you for your word, which is perfect and precious to us. It contains within it all the promises we need to live the life that pleases you. We ask now, Holy Spirit, that you'd be with us, that you'd help me to preach better than I'm able to, that you'd keep me out of error, and that you'd help the truth take root in our hearts so we'd be more like Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Man, y'all be seated. Uh, several years ago, I was in seminary working on a degree, hoping to someday be a pastor of a church like this and to have the privilege of standing before God's people week after week 
and preaching the Bible. And I took a class on the Sermon on the Mount with a professor named Jonathan Pennington. And it was a really, really good class and shaped me in a lot of ways. But he ended up writing a book called How to Read the Gospels Wisely. And I remember in 2016 reading that book and underlining it and really wrestling with what it meant to preach through a gospel. I wasn't a pastor at the time. I mean, I was a pastor, but I wasn't the senior pastor. I didn't get to choose what we preached on Sundays. So I was dreaming of the day when I had the opportunity to open up a book like the Gospel of Mark and proclaim it section by section to God's people. And that book really changed my thinking in a lot of ways about the Bible and about preaching. And it did so because as if you're from around here and you've been, you've been around here a couple of years, you kind of know I tend to spend a lot of time and think a lot like the Apostle Paul. And Paul wrote a lot of letters in the New Testament, and so there's plenty to think about. I've preached through Ephesians since I've been here, and I've preached through Titus since I've been here, and I'm teaching through 1 Timothy 3 right now on Wednesday nights. I just, I, my home base is the Apostle Paul. And because of that, I, I think I tend to think about my faith in Christ and about the kind of faith I want to help instill in God's people here at CBC in the terms that Paul often uses. And he often thinks in straight lines, in theological propositions, and, and doctrinal truth statements. But when you come to something like the Gospel of Mark, you don't get theology in little bite-sized sentences. Instead, you get them in stories. And so we tend to think about our faith, and, and if you're like me, you tend to think about it in categories and in language that Paul gives us. And so I think about 2 Corinthians 5.17, which defines for me how I think about what Jesus has done for me in my life. That if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. That's a beautiful theological truth. That's a doctrinal statement that is true for every Christian. If anybody trusts in Jesus, they're a new creation. But then you come to a passage like we just read at the end of Mark chapter 1, and Jesus doesn't give a theological soundbite, a doctrinal truth claim that you might would get tattooed on your chest. Instead, he just makes somebody new. He just does it. A theological truth that Paul preaches is completely consistent with what Jesus does, but Jesus accomplishes it in real life, in a story for a person with real flesh and blood like me and you. It's not abstract. It's real. And this week, I hope you see how real it can be for you. That Jesus is willing to make you clean. This isn't just some abstract theological concept that Jesus is capable of healing a person. And Jesus' heart for us is that we would be new, we would be clean. In fact, this morning I want you to know Jesus is willing to cleanse you of the sin that separates you from God. I want to prove that to you by working through the passage we just read, this story about the leper who's healed. If you've been with us over the past four or five weeks, you've, you've been with us as we walked through Mark chapter 1. We've seen Mark identify Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of God, the King, the one who came preaching, the times fulfilled, the kingdom of God's at hand, repent and believe the gospel. He called his first disciples and marched into Capernaum to a church service kind of like this, and he taught with authority. It was amazing. People are like, wow, we've never heard anybody teach like that before. And then a guy with a demon shows up, and he casts the demon out. And they say, what is this, a man who can even command the unclean spirits? And they listen to him. After church, he went to Simon's house where his mother-in-law was sick, and Jesus healed her. And then the whole city gathered outside of his door, and he stayed up into the night healing them all. But you'll remember, that ministry fruit that he experienced couldn't keep him distracted from the mission God had given him. So we left last week with him telling his disciples, let's leave Capernaum and go someplace else so I can preach. This story, Mark 1, 40 to 45, the story of this leper is a continuation of what we've seen. It's Jesus on the way to another town to preach. Before he could get there, this, this leper comes up and, and bows down before him and begs him to heal him. It, it's a continuation of the healing ministry that we've seen. But it also is a crescendo. It's building because the leper is unlike anybody Jesus has dealt with before, as we're going to see in a second. At the same time, it prepares us for what's going to come after. In Mark chapter 2, we're going to see these two competing pressures coming in on Jesus all the time. On the one hand, there's going to be crowds of people 
who are, are so adoring of Jesus and want such uh, a time with him that he's not able to even enter into cities. And on the other hand, growing hostility from the religious establishment who want nothing to do with Jesus and are convinced he's leading the people astray. And this little section, this little story, not abstract theology, but real life stuff, is important. Mark hinges it, and he draws our attention to three features that I want you to see this morning. The first is the leper's deep need. The leper's deep need. Uh, Mark just sort of rolls into the story, a leper came to Jesus. A leper came to Jesus. And maybe you're thinking to yourself, what exactly is a leper? Well, leprosy was a skin condition and category of skin condition used in the ancient world for all kinds of things. Things as simple as a discoloration on your skin or a minor rash, all the way to what we know today as leprosy. It's called Hansen's disease, which causes uh, a severe disfigurement of the skin and decomposing flesh while a person's still alive. All that was involved in the label leprosy in the ancient world. God had instructed his people about it. It was so common they needed to know how to handle it. And so in the Old Testament book of Leviticus, chapters 13 and 14, he gave them detailed instructions on how they could identify leprosy and what to do if it took root in a person or in an object of clothing or in a home. He gave them rituals to perform so they could be cleansed and um, brought back into normal society. You see, the leper or the leprous object was ceremonially and ritually unclean and couldn't exist within God's holy people. It had to be quarantined and segregated. In fact, the first century Jewish historian named Josephus described it as being the equivalent of interacting with a corpse. A person who had leprosy was just like a dead body. Because of that, they had to be separated not just from the normal community, like the society at large or the church family, they had to be alienated even from their own family, from their friends. They had to live separate from society. And everywhere they went, they had to cover their lips and announce to the world, unclean, unclean, unclean. To make matters worse, there was no known cure for leprosy in the ancient world. And even today, like legitimate Hansen's disease has a treatment plan, but it's, uh, it's long and arduous. The rabbis said that to be able to cure leprosy was to perform a miracle on the order of raising the dead. As a result, to be a leper or to be afflicted with leprosy meant that you were going to suffer almost unimaginable social, economic, spiritual, and physical pain. It's like hard to even imagine. Most people believe that to be infected with leprosy was an indication of one's judgment from God. And so not only were they suffering from a debilitating illness that alienated them from society and their own family, there was also a stigma that went along with it, that people assumed that you were some kind of terrible and wicked sinner. So by the time this man in Mark 140 busts through the normal religious convictions and falls down at Jesus' feet and wraps his arm around his knees and says, if you're willing, please make me clean. He's already suffered more than you and I can even imagine. He's a broken person, physically disfigured, alienated from family and friends for who knows how long, living on the outskirts of society, a pariah. Everybody avoids him with all they've got. But he hears about Jesus the man who stayed up late healing everybody in Capernaum, and he runs to find him to see if he can intervene at the point of his need. Now, I love this story. I mean, this is the, the beauty of the Gospels, is that it's not abstract theological concept, Jesus can heal, because we know that, we've seen that already, but what the story of the leper tells us is that there's no need that anyone could ever experience that's beyond Jesus' ability to cure it. Nothing. No, 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 no need is so far removed from Jesus' ability to cure. I can't even begin to imagine what he must have experienced. And we're not given details about how long he'd been suffering from leprosy. But it's, it's obvious from what we know about it in the ancient world that his horrific skin disease, the alienation that resulted from it, is beyond anything you and I can imagine. 
And yet at the same time, I, I kind of can relate. I've kind of been there. I've, I've experienced abandonment. I've betrayal. I've experienced heartache. I've experienced walking into the lunchroom and not knowing anyone and thinking they're all thinking about me. And, you know, those kind of things that we struggle with in life. And they're silly and you expect to grow beyond them. But sometimes those things take root and they shape us and they make us the people we are. According to the story, we can bring that kind of heartache and dysfunction to Jesus and expect him to heal us. You know, he's not under any illusion about our need, about our neediness. He knows exactly who we are and what we're dealing with. But, but isn't it true that sometimes we're under an illusion about our neediness? You know, if you had a visible deformity in your skin that caused people to shun you, it'd be easy to point to that and identify it as the main problem that you need Jesus to intervene on in your life. But most of what you and I are fed through our culture and society tells us that our, ba- our biggest problems are actually not in here at all. They're outside of us. That we're all suffering from deficiencies in education. You know? And if we, just, if we just got the right education, if we just knew the right things, we'd be able to make better decisions and our life would sort of fall into place. It tells us we suffer from deficiency of resources. You know, if we just had the, the financial means to get that thing or to accomplish that goal, then our life would fall into place. Tell us uh, if, if our society was really just, we wouldn't be dealing with the things that we're dealing with. But that's an illusion. That's an illusion. In fact, the scriptures tell us, and Jesus himself says, that it's not what goes into a person that defiles them, but what comes out of them. That our biggest problem, our, our deepest point of need is within. God spoke through his prophet Jeremiah. He said, although you wash yourselves with lye and use much soap, the stain of your iniquity is before me. You know, we're, we're kind of blind to sometimes our sin in a way that the leper couldn't be blind to his deformity. He knew it. It was everywhere. He had to announce it. But we sometimes forget our deepest need, that we are sinners alienated from God because of our sin. Sin is not something that we do. I mean, it is something we do, but it's not just something we do. We don't just commit sins. We are sinful by nature. So that sin infects everything we say, think, and do. It's just everywhere. It's like the stain that infects whatever it touches. Our relationships blow up. We start out with great goals at the beginning of the year, and sooner or later we bomb those too. Now it's kind of like we need somebody who could come to us and remind us that though we don't have leprosy, we do have the stain of sin. We need like God said through Isaiah, though your sins are like scarlet, I'll make you white as snow. We need some kind of clarity like David had in Psalm 51 after he'd committed adultery with Bathsheba and murdered her husband to cover it up. He said to the Lord, he said, against you and you only have I sinned. He said, my my sin is ever before me. He knew his deep need, just like the leper did. And he prayed in Psalm 51, 7, wash me. And make me white as snow. This this story focuses our attention on the leper's deep need. And it's like shining a mirror into our own souls so that we could see our need. And when we see our need, the need we have to be freed from the stain of sin, like the leper, we ought to run to Jesus, fall at his knees, and say, if you will, make me clean. When that happens, we'll see the second thing, which is the compassionate heart of Jesus. So we see the leper's deep need, the compassionate heart of Jesus. Mark tells us that Jesus was moved with compassion and stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. No, I I love it because Jesus is totally undistracted by the breach of protocol here. You know, Jesus knows the law. He fulfills the law completely. He knows that a person who comes in contact with a leper is rendered ritually unclean and comes under the risk of contracting the disease themselves. But when the man falls at his feet and wraps his arms around his knees, he doesn't say, get off me, you're unclean and a leper. Instead, Mark says that he is moved with compassion. This word is amazing. A lot of times when we talk about a deep emotional response, we say something's gut-wrenching. Or we say it's heartbreaking. 
that at the very core of our being, we feel the reality of something. And the Greeks didn't talk about a person's heart. They talked about their splachna, which is like their kidneys. And what Mark tells us is that when this man fell at Jesus' feet, he had a deep, visceral, gut-wrenching response to him. He was broken by what he saw. In fact, some of the earliest Greek manuscripts don't have the word moved with compassion. It says instead that he was moved with anger. Jesus saw this man come up and fall at his feet, and in a moment he took it all in. He saw the man disfigured by disease. He saw a man alienated from his family, brokenhearted, shunned by society, living with all kind of questions about his dignity, value, and worth. And Jesus' heart broke for him. He's brokenhearted. He was gut-wrenching in his act of compassion. And so what does he do? He says, I am willing. And he cleansed him. Mark tells us he didn't just pronounce the words, that he reached out and touched him. William Lane, the uh, commentator, one of the commentators I've been leaning on for this series, he talks about the way that this act of touch is significant in two ways. First, he says, it's an unheard of act of compassion towards the leper. And I've, I've reiterated it a thousand times, and you understand, I hope, that lepers were shunned by society. No physical contact whatsoever. Pass on the other side of the street. Announce your presence. We want nothing to do with you. I mean, for years and years and years and years, it had been reinforced to this man that he was untouchable, undesirable, and despicable. And when he finally finds somebody that he thinks might be able, he doesn't doubt his ability. He doesn't say, if you're able. He knows Jesus is able. But when he finds somebody who just might be willing to heal him, he's not reiterated once again, hey, I'm glad to heal you, but keep your hands off me. Instead, Jesus reaches out his tan hands in an unheard of act of compassion and touches him. He willingly enters into this man's brokenness, takes it on himself, gladly involves himself in what's going on for the man. So it's an unheard of act of compassion. And it shows us Jesus' heart, number two, that Jesus knew the law, and yet he also knew a greater law, the law of love. When the law of love came in conflict with the law of Moses, Jesus was going to gladly override the law so that he could enter into compassion for the man. He's going to do it next week when we see this man healed on the Sabbath. Uh, Jesus, he, his, his love for God and his love for people came first. And that's what we see when Jesus reached out and touches him. And because of that, we get this beautiful picture of Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, the King, overwhelmed with emotion, reaching out, entering in to this man's brokenness and setting him free. We see the compassionate heart of Jesus. And I wonder what your normal default view of God is, and if it has any room for this kind of person. Do you have room in your view of God for Jesus' compassionate heart? Or do you think of him as a cruel and exacting judge who's always standing in the corner with his clipboard, seeing how bad you mess up today? you see him as a, a distant deity somewhere in the sky who's watching but not really involved you see him as a reluctant healer well, he's glad to help but you know you're gonna have to beg him a few times and when when God actually gets down to describing himself the word he reaches for most readily is a word compassionate he says to Moses in Exodus 34 6 he says I am the Lord the Lord God compassionate and gracious slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgressions, and sin. That's how God describes himself. A compassionate God, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. The psalmist reflects on this in Psalm 86, and he just turns it into a prayer of praise. You, O Lord, are a God, merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abundant in loving kindness and truth. Does your God fit that picture? We're talking about a God who said through the prophet Ezekiel, who often brought harsh words to his people. He said in Ezekiel 18, 23, I don't delight in the destruction of the wicked. We're talking about the God that Peter describes in 2 Peter 3. He says that he is patient, not desiring that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. And in the world, we, we know what it's like to work for 
exacting people, people who expect perfection. And when you mess up, they let you know. We know what it's like, maybe, to have a parent never seems happy with what you do. But that's not Jesus. Jesus sees us at the deepest point of our need, and he extends his compassionate heart. I mean, you think about it. You, you know this verse, I hope. John three sixteen, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shouldn't perish but have everlasting life. And when God gets ready to act, when God gets ready to do something, whether it's in the story of Mark 1, 40 to 45, or when it's just God's actions in general, he doesn't do it reluctantly or begrudgingly. God does it out of an overflow of his loving and compassionate heart. He acts because he loves. In fact, it's what Paul says in Romans chapter 5. He says that, you know, scarcely would one ever die for a righteous person. Okay, though perhaps it's conceivable that for a righteous man, one would dare to die, right? That's a confusing way to say. What, what I think Paul means there is that um, usually the only time you'd give your life for someone is if they were a really good person. If you had a lot of admiration and respect for them. If they were quantifiably good, it's conceivable that somebody might would lay down their life for a good person. But Paul says what God did is totally unlike that. God showed his love for us and that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. So when we're thinking about our deepest need, the, the, the worst you can imagine, I mean, uh, a heart of sin that's bent in on itself and only wants what it wants, God saw us there. No illusions about who we were, what we were about, and he extended his love to us and gave us his only son. That is the compassionate heart of Jesus. Does that fit your view of God, and have you experienced that compassion? I think about that compassion, and, and I have experienced it. It's the love that won't let me go. And, uh, you know, I've tried to run from God, and, and he won't let me. And what the Scriptures tells us is that for a person who's really experienced the compassionate heart of Jesus, it changes everything. It changes the way we interact with others. I mean, for example, we're called to love one another just as Christ loved us. That's John 13, 34. Paul says... In Ephesians 4, verse 32, he says, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. And be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for you, an offering and a sacrifice to God, and a fragrant aroma. Now what that tells me is that a person like us, like, like me, who's experienced the compassionate art of Jesus in my life, meeting me at the deepest point of my need, and saving me out of it, ought to love other people. Does that, does that fit with your understanding of the Christian life? Then why do we come to be so dull to the suffering of people around us? You know, I, you think about Jesus' parable, the Good Samaritan, and all the good religious people who passed by the man who was dying on the side of the road before a Samaritan finally came and showed God's compassion. You know, why, why is that the case for many of us? Why do we see the news every day and become dull to the genuine suffering of others? If a, if a leper had come up to me and fallen at my feet and wrapped his arms around me, would my first reaction have been brokenhearted, gut-wrenching compassion? Or not? You know, I was telling my kids and Aaron about it this week. In 2011, I got to go on a mission trip to the Dominican Republic. And uh, the Dominican Republic is a really poor place. But we were actually staying in a resort area that's known for um, the resorts that are there for European men who come and take advantage of the young women who live in the, in the area. And um, one of our mission teams got to spend a day in one of the local trash slums where Haitian immigrants were literally living in garbage. And uh, I'll never forget, because here I am, I was like 21 at the time, 22, and I'm going into ministry, and so, you know, I've got this kind of gung-ho, go-get-em attitude for God. And I, I, I probably would have thought at that moment in time, I would have done anything the Lord had asked me to do. We walked into this place, they called it Redemption Village, and it's just, you know, piles of trash and little huts and running water through it that the people drink out of. And they see us all come in, and all these little kids come running to us. 
You know, and they want to, it's like you've seen on all the commercials and, and on all the missions uh, pamphlets. They, they want to hold you. They want to they play. They want to see your, your trinkets and your toys, and they want to interact with you. They've never known anybody to love them the way that these mission teams do. And I can't describe to you the experience of revulsion I had as those kids crawled over me. Just, I felt so dirty. You know, here I am wanting to express the love of Jesus, but I can't get beyond the immediate senses of sight and smell and feel. But you're telling me Jesus sees a man covered in rags, skin falling off his face, completely broken hearted, and his first reaction is to reach out and touch him and extend compassion? Wow. God, make me like that. I want to I wanna be that way because there may not be a leper in this town, but there are people who feel like a leper in Luling, Texas. People who've been rejected by everybody who ought to ever love them, who live in houses that you couldn't imagine. We drive by it every day, completely blinded to it. But Jesus has a different feeling, a different heart. He sees it and he weeps. His stomach turns at the despicable injustice of it all, and he acts with compassion. So if we've experienced the compassion that Jesus has for us, we ought to be generous in extending that compassion to others. And if you haven't experienced that compassion, well, you can today. And I want to tell you how, how you can come to know that Jesus cares about you, regardless of your circumstances. And I'm going to make it real clear for you, but I want to tell you first the benefit of it. Because after a person sees their deepest need and comes to Jesus to experience his compassionate heart, they experience the joyful freedom of being cleansed. And that's what we see in verse 43. After Jesus healed the leper, he sternly warned him and immediately sent him away. And he said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded as a testimony to them. But he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the news around to such an extent that Jesus could no longer publicly enter a city stayed out in unpopulated areas, and they were coming to him from everywhere. This is a strange few verses, and I, I hope I've gotten it right in my understanding of it. But Jesus instructs this guy, after he's healed him, to go to the priest and to go through all these rituals and, and the steps. It's about a two-week process to be declared clean. And Jesus does this, I think, because he cares for the man in more ways than just restoring his physical body. Right? Jesus understands that the brokenness that this man is experiencing goes beyond his condition, but to all the social and religious and economic web that he's entangled in. And so he wants to detangle it all. And the only way he can do that is by going to the priest and being declared clean. And then he can go and be part of his family again. And so Jesus' heart is for full and complete restoration for this guy. It's Hard to un overestimate that. Like, that is what Jesus is after. He wants this guy to experience full restoration. But then you come face to face with the facts, as Mark conveys them to us, that there's no indication that this guy ever makes it to the priest, that he ever goes through the motions of ritual and sacrifice. Instead, every indication we have is this guy disobeys Jesus at every opportunity he has. Tells him to be silent, and he goes away declaring the good news. Tells him to go to the priest, and he just goes out and starts talking. And I think this lack of obedience is, is the challenging part for me as a preacher and as a pastor and as a Christian. It's like, I know we're usually on very unstable ground when we start disobeying Jesus' clear commands. Right? That's what we've been learning in our Sunday school class, if you're going through the Gospel Project, that sin is transgression. It's failing to obey God when he commands something, and it's failing to do what God commands. So this guy transgressed Jesus' clear commandments. What gives? And I don't understand it completely, but I think I've got these two points that I want you to think about with me. That number one, a person who experiences the grace of God has to talk about it. So Jesus tells him, you know, keep silent, which is something Jesus is going to do a lot in the gospel. He's going to tell people to keep their mouth shut, not to tell anybody about him. But surely Jesus, being God in flesh and knowing people's thoughts and intentions, he knew this guy had no hope of keeping quiet. There was, there was no hope. This guy just got his life back. 
You know, I told you the rabbi said that healing a leper was like the same kind of miracle as raising someone from the dead. And that's basically what happened for this guy. He was basically dead. He was a walking corpse. Nobody could touch him. Nobody could be around him. He was alienated from his family. He had no hope of any kind of future. He was as good as dead. And in a word, Jesus had completely transformed him. He'd given him his life back. Surely Jesus knows that the only natural response to that kind of experience of grace is going to be talking about it with everybody who will listen. Surely Jesus knows it's, it's just the automatic response. It's like what the song we sing, you know, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound, Saved a Wretch Like Me, I Once Was Blind, Lost, But Now I'm Found, Was Blind, But Now I See. That should be the experience of every Christian. You experience Amazing Grace, you want to sing about it, you want to talk about it. And it's going to be a constant response from people in the Gospels, that as soon as they experience Jesus' healing power, they start spreading the good news. I think about the man in, in John chapter 8 who was born blind, and he's brought in for this whole kind of uh, trial and inquisition about who, who was responsible for this miraculous thing. And he says, I don't know. I just know it was this guy. I was blind yesterday, and now I can see. Take it up with him. Right? That's the way it works. When people experience the grace of God in their life, they're going to talk about it. And so Jesus commands him to keep silent, but i got to think in the back of Jesus' mind, he's smiling to himself, thinking, I know you're not going to keep silent, and I don't intend for you to keep silent, because if you keep silent, even the rocks will cry out. In fact, Peter says in 1 Peter 2 that we weren't God's people at one time. At one time, we were alienated from God, separated by our sin, but now we are God's people. And he's, we're a people for his own possession, he says in 1 Peter 2, 9, so that we may proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. That, that is the reality for every person who experiences God's grace. So I don't, I don't really know what to make of just on its face the disobedience that this man puts forward. But I know it's totally consistent with the way God intends to work through you. That he wants you to experience his grace so that you will tell other people about it. So that you will shout it to the rooftop. You, you think about social media. Let me see, raise, raise your hand if you're on Facebook. Okay, if we're not friends on Facebook, ask to be my friend. I want to snoop on what you do in your free time. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but you think about social media, and there's lots of, lots of different views on social media and hot takes on the impact it's having on society. And I, I'll let you guys know at every chance that I think social media is awful. Wish we could go back to a world without it. But one good redeeming quality is that we get to celebrate together through social media. And you, you think about this. All the baby announcements that you've seen on Facebook and Instagram over the last 15 years, all the little photos of the mom and dad holding an ultrasound and the little baby shoes and the little, you know, board with the different catchy slogans they put together. I mean, it's just so cute. It's so wonderful. You, you think about all the women who've gotten engaged in the last 15 years, and every one of them has posted a picture of their ring on their photo kissing their, husband, their, their future husband. You know, it's, it's just what it is. And I think that idea that when you experience something so radically life-changing that you're joyful, you're overwhelmed with joy, you want to invite other people into it. And I think that's what this guy does. I mean, he didn't have social media. He couldn't tweet or hashtag or anything like that. But if he could have, he would have. Because Jesus had just turned his life upside down. He was experiencing fullness of joy, and he wanted everybody to share in it. So I think that's going on. I also think that a person who experiences the grace of God receives full forgiveness, perfect reconciliation, and complete cleansing from their sins. And instinctively, this leper knew that he could go to the priest and go through the motions, but it wasn't going to accomplish anything he didn't already possess. And so, and so let me explain that. Um, in Leviticus 13 and 14, and I really would, I mean, I would encourage you to read Leviticus 13 and 14 today because it's really beautiful the elaborate ritual, there's um, cedar and hyssop involved and smoke that would be waved over the leper. And then they would take two doves, and they would kill one dove and drain its blood into a bowl of water. And they would take the other dove while it was alive, and they would dip it in the bowl of blood and water and then set it free. And then they would take a lamb, and they would sacrifice a lamb, and they would drain its blood into a bowl, and the priest would smear the blood on the leper. All those things are real bizarre to us, and if I came in here and tried to do that next week, you ought to get rid of me, fire me as fast as you can, all right? But they were highly significant for them, and each act told them something true, that there was a real thing called leprosy. It wasn't just in their head, and it had to be dealt with, and only God could come through. 
So they had to have this smoke waved over them and wafted so they could be cleansed. But we also know that sin was the cause of their leprosy, whether in the specific or in general, because they lived in a broken world. And the only way to reconcile a person from sin was through the shedding of blood. And so that dove had to be sacrificed and killed. The other dove represented the uncleanliness, the impurity that resulted from leprosy. And so when it was dipped in the blood and set free, it symbolized the fact that their uncleanliness and impurity had been removed from them. And when the lamb was sacrificed and the blood was smeared on the, on the worshiper, it was proof to them that they had been reconciled to God, that their sins had been forgiven, and they were back in fellowship with him. Now, this leper should have, both by the command of Moses and by Jesus' direct statement, go offer your sacrifice to the priest as a testimony to them. He should have gone and done all that. But I just got to wonder if in the back of his mind, he instinctively knew that there was no need for the priest's confirmation. And after all, anybody who had eyes to see could have looked at the man and recognized that he was no leper no more. His, the leper's spots were gone. No disfigurement whatsoever. In a second, all of his skin was restored to normal. He was clean. You wouldn't have known he was a leper if you hadn't have been standing there five seconds before. He was clean. And so what, what need did he have to go anywhere and do anything? He was clean, and everybody who saw him was going to know it. But then I think on the deeper level, maybe this leper was acting on a faith. A faith that while Moses' laws in Leviticus 13 and 14 were useful and important for the season of life that God had given it to his people for, in order to prepare them for a future Messiah, maybe he knew from Jesus' own words that the time had been fulfilled and the kingdom of God was at hand. And that somebody better than Moses was there and a sacrifice more effective than any dove or lamb was about to be offered. And maybe he knew by faith, better than maybe he could have even put it to words, what the author of the letter to the Hebrews said in verse 13, chapter 9. If the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling those who have been defiled, sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, well, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Maybe he knew that, hey, those doves are great. There's a better sacrifice for me. Maybe you knew what the author said in chapter 10, verse 11, that every priest stands ministering every day, offering time and time again the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But he, that's Jesus, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. For by one offering he's perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. You know, my, my hope, and I think this is where I landed this week on this sermon, is that this leper understood something deeper than anybody else at that time could have known. The only way to explain his lack of obedience to Jesus' clear command to go to the priest was the faith he had that Jesus himself was going to purify and cleanse him. He believed that Jesus was going to offer a sacrifice in his own blood. He was going to make his sins like snow. He was going to remove the stain of his guilt. You know, that's what the Bible tells us over and over and over again. But yeah, our problems, there are problems in the world, but our main problem is not out there. It's in here. And God, out of a compassionate heart, sent his own son Jesus to live a sinless life and to perf perfectly fulfill the law in every dot and tittle so that at the end of his life he could offer himself as a complete sacrifice for our sins, that he could suffer the punishment that that leper deserved, that he could bear the curse that our sins merit. And so that on the third day when God raised him up from the dead, he could offer, in reality, newness of life to all who trust in him, to have their stain removed. That's why the Apostle John could say in 1 John 1, 7, that if we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all our sins. It's why he could tell a church that he loved as much as I love y'all. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, for me, if you want to understand who God is and what God is offering to the world, you couldn't do much better than zeroing in on Mark 1, 40 to 45. Because it presses home to us our deep need 
But every last one of us, maybe we're not lepers, but man, we're broken people who despite our best intentions cause harm to the people around us and leave undone the things that God has commanded. The things we know we should do, we don't do. We're needy. And it shows us that God is loving and has a heart of compassion for us despite it. That even when we are at our worst, He gives us His best. He extends His hand. He touches us. He enters into His brokenness, taking on the likeness of sinful flesh and submitting Himself completely to God's law. And he promises that whoever comes to him and trusts in him can experience full forgiveness, the joy that comes from cleansing. And so this morning, I would encourage you, if you haven't experienced the compassion that we're talking about, to repent of your sins, to name them for what they are, to recognize them as disobedience to God and rebellion against his authority, and ask him for his forgiveness. He knows it all, he's under no illusion. Just admit to him what he already knows. Repent of your sin. Maybe you need to pray a prayer like this. God, make me clean. And having been made clean, maybe you need to be like this leper and make it public. You need to tell somebody about it. You need to tell your family when you get home from church today. Hey, y'all, I've been dealing with some stuff. I've been carrying a burden. But today, I fell down at Jesus' feet, wrapped my arms around his knees, and said, make me clean. And he did. You need to tell somebody. I'd love to know about it. If you're making that kind of commitment today, I want to cheer on what God is doing in your life. Maybe you need to make it public by being baptized. We're baptizing next Sunday. Maybe you need to be baptized too. You know, baptism is this beautiful symbol of a person's participation in Christ's death, that we've been buried with Christ in baptism and raised to walk in newness of life. But Peter also says that baptism shows us in our eyes the truth that God cleanses us, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a clean conscience. And it's true that as wet as your body is when you come up out of the water, that's as clean as you are in God's sight because of what Christ has done for you. And so maybe you need to make it public that you have been cleansed by Jesus by being baptized. And CBC, let us, this year, 2022, take on the heart of Jesus who looks for broken people and enters in with a heart of compassion. Let's become a people known for that. You want to? All right, let's pray together. God in heaven, we love you. And we praise you for your gift of Jesus. And we thank you that even when we are at our worst, you extend to us a a heart of compassion. You give us your best in Jesus. We thank you for his life of perfect obedience. We thank you that he's not scandalized by our sin, but he loves us despite it. I pray this morning for those who are wrestling with burdens and brokenness in their own life, that you would cleanse them completely. They'd know full forgiveness and reconciliation that only comes by his blood. Pray that you'd help us all this year to be compassionate in the way we deal with other people, especially difficult and dirty people. God, help us to love like you love. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood, loose all their guilty stains, loose all my 
my sins away and there may I go vile as he wash all my sins away dear dying lamb thy precious blood shall never again for being here with us for worship and if you're a guest today it really was a pleasure to have you here we'd love to know how we can encourage you and if you want you could fill out one of those forms that's in the back of the pew and just bring it by over here in a minute where i'll be standing you can text the number 830-217-1913 or scan the code however we just want to encourage you and pray for you if there's a way we can please let us know y'all yesterday our men's fellowship got rained out and we're looking for a time to postpone it but, um, y'all, there's still plenty of stuff going on at CBC this month, and I want to make you know about a few things. First, on October 30th, we are having our annual Noah's Ark Carnival. It's going to be on Saturday afternoon from 4 to 6. And we need y'all's help. We need some volunteers, and you can sign up today in the info corner. But we really need some candy. And so if you can bring some candy, there will be some buckets out over the next few weeks, and you can help us fill that up. We're looking forward to having a bunch of people outside on campus for lots of fun, make contact with people in our community who need a church. And in two weeks from day, today, we're going to have a, a special team day hymn sing and chili cook-off. My nose is stopped up, and so people have had a hard time understanding me when I say hymn. But we're going to come in here at 5.30 for just some informal time of singing. Mike's going to teach us some new songs. And uh, it's going to be a good time. And then we're going to have chili in the fellowship hall. And our hospitality team is going to provide the cornbread, drinks, and dessert. We just need to bring our best pot of chili we can muster so that we can beat each other in the contest. And so uh, make plans to be here on October 17th for that. It's going to be awesome. The next Sunday, we do have a baptism day plan. And uh, after church, we've got our next steps lunch for people who are new to CBC and want to learn more about what it means to be a member or ask questions about our church. And so if any of those things apply to you, I'd love to uh, have you be a part. And so just let us know. You can sign up for next steps either by following the link that's in the bulletin 
or there's a, a sheet in the info corner that you can sign up on, and that'll let us know how to prepare lunch for you and your family. And last but not least, today and Wednesday night are your last opportunities to have your picture made for our church family directory. And the binders came in this week, and so we're getting super close. All we're waiting on are your pictures. So if you haven't had your picture made, stick around today after church right here on stage, and we'll, we'll get your picture made. Or if you can't stick around today, come back on Wednesday night at 730 and have your picture made. And uh, it'll be great. We'll know how to pray for you at home because we see you every week at church, and we want to do that. So stick around for that. The last thing I want to do is I want to ask Debbie Butler to come up here on stage for me. And Aaron, can you help me out? Y'all give Miss Debbie a hand. Are you going to just stay down there or you want to come up? Cool. Yeah, here I'll come down here with you. Okay. All right. So y'all may or may not know, but for the last few years, Debbie has led our ministry of Taco Tuesday on Tuesday nights, which we've fed as many as o over 100 people some weeks and through the uh, pandemic, you headed up our grocery distribution. And with the change in circumstances and everything, I think, you know, the team obviously decided that right now it's not a great time to be doing Taco Tuesday, and so maybe in the future we'll revisit it. But we didn't want to let your faithfulness oh. go without honoring. And so uh, we really do appreciate all you did in leading that ministry. This is a gift from our church to you. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, she wants to say something. Hey, can she borrow one of y'all's microphones? Oh, you're going to do great. I'm going to do great. Just hold it real close. Uh, real close? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? A program like Taco Tuesday does not rely on one person. It's a very labor-intensive first uh, program. And um, I would ask the people involved with Taco Tuesday to stand up, but everybody's standing, and that's about what it took. But everybody in the church did it. The Dickinsons, the uh, Matthews, uh, J.W. Hall was really the best one because he was our dishwasher, so we relied yeah. on him a lot. <laughs> uh, Tyree, um, I can't see everybody there. Uh, Winifred and Jerry, when they were in town, they were always there. It was a massive program, and it took lots and lots of people. There was just not me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I am not that good. You know, <laughs> I have to have lots of people. And the most important thing they did was they wouldn't let me cook. So. Okay, so that's good. No one died. <laughs> no one was poisoned. Uh, so I thank everybody that worked on the program. And if I missed anybody, Rodney. Rodney did a, a, his own uh, own bread. If you need cornbread, you find Mr. Man. Okay, we'll be thinking uh, about that. So there was just lots and lots of people, and so yeah. we thank everybody yeah. in the church. Absolutely, okay. absolutely. And we do want to thank the church. Yeah, let's give Debbie a hand. We're going to pray for her. <laughs> but, um, and, and a lot of y'all gave financially to make Taco Tuesday happen, and when the team decided to shut it down, we still had quite a bit of funds in there. And so they decided they're going to keep $2,000 set aside for future seed money for a hunger-related ministry when the time arises. And we're going to donate $2,000 to the SBC Disaster Relief for those who are cleaning up uh, from Hurricane Ida and feeding food and stuff like that. So um, thank you for your generosity and contribution. All right, well, let's, let's pray for Miss Debbie. Uh, the Bible says to outdo one another in showing honor. And so we want to outdo you in showing honor. We thank you so much for all you did. We want to pray for you. All right, let's pray, church. God in heaven, we thank you so much for the faithfulness of your people, and we especially thank you for Debbie. God, week after week, making sure there were groceries to cook, making sure there were groceries to put in brown paper bags, organizing volunteers, making sure all those cooking teams knew which week was their week, and we thank you for her faithfulness. God, help us to have the same kind of heart she had for hungry people. Help us to be faithful like she was faithful, working us in the way that you worked in her, for Jesus' sake. In his name we pray, amen. Amen. Hey, y'all are dismissed. We love you, church. Y'all thank Debbie on your way out, and uh, we'll see you next week. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely.